speaking today with Andy Kane and Tanya Hayes of Fraser Healthcare Partners. Uh, Fraser has made diversity, equity, inclusion, and advancement a real focus for them, not only in their portfolio companies, but also for themselves. Um, Andy and Tanya here have led the firm's human capital and ESG efforts, and they have taken some really unusual steps towards making significant progress. So we're thrilled to have them here. Welcome, Andy and Tanya, and thanks for joining us. Um, I'll start with you, Andy. So Fraser has been very deliberate in approaching what you've identified as You've said diversity, equity, inclusion, and advancement very specifically. Can you talk about each of those aspects and how you define them and why they're each important? Yeah, thanks, Phyllis. So that, thanks first for the opportunity to talk about you know what we think, what we're trying to do at Frazier. I would say that um, you see the program, people's programs. You know, it's D D and I or it's D and D E and I, and we sort of started the, the, the terminology of it is sort of has isn't settled, so to speak. So I think we started from the like a white background approach or a whiteboard approach of say, what are we really trying to do? You know, and we said, we thought about it in terms of, we want to make sure that we have diversity of thinking and diversity of ethnicity and diversity of gender across, you know, our whole sort of ecosphere. So that's a diversity piece of it. And then we wanted to make sure that people are treated and compensated fairly. And so that's the equity point of view. We wanted to make sure that people felt like it, they were in a place where their values were uh, important and they were listened to and they felt engaged and inspired by their workplace. And so that speaks to the inclusion. And then you could have all of those things, but if people aren't minorities and underrepresented minorities and people of different ethnicities and sexual orientations aren't advancing in the organization, then we weren't really living up to our value of having societal impact. And so that's where the advancement piece you know, we felt like was an important element of what we were trying to accomplish. And that's why we think about it in terms of DEIA. That's great, super helpful. So, so you put this, you started a whiteboard, you put the, the metrics around it, or the framework around it. What were the first steps that you took? And I guess we'll ask you about Fraser and about your portfolio companies, but as Fraser, what were the first steps you took to significantly improve your know, performance on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, when I when I um, was hired, I like to tell a story. I mean, Alan Frazier has always been sort of a forward thinker in this space, and he took um, you know myself and and his wife and my wife to dinner, and he said, "I'm very proud of what we've done at Frazier in a lot of ways, but we are not leaders in this space in the way I would like us to be." And specifically at that time, he was talking about gender diversity. We didn't at that time we didn't have a female investment professional, we didn't have a female on our center of excellence team, and uh, so we sort of started there. Um, and over a period of time, what we did, we just got very sort of aggressive in terms of our recruiting efforts, and we didn't settle. We made sure we were recruiting female candidates, and we, we would ask every executive we came to, who are the top female executives in healthcare that we should get to meet? And out of that, you know, we ended up hiring multiple investment professionals that are, that are women. We obviously hired Tanya as a, sort of our first women uh, female partner on the Center of Excellence side. But then, of course, there was a transition where it was not that we were ignoring, you know, underrepresented minorities, but we weren't making a concerted effort either. And the George Floyd events, uh, you know, of the 2020 summer were really sort of a wake up call for us where we looked at ourselves in the mirror and just said, you know, gosh, we can do be doing better. You know, we have a platform from which to create opportunities to advance, um, you know, um, the career trajectories of underrepresented minorities you know, in so many ways, and let's take advantage of that opportunity. And so the first steps were, it really came from the groundswell up, where Tani and I were getting emails from the team saying, we could do this, we could do that, how come we're not doing this? And so what we decided to do was create a DEIA working group, which is 16 individuals ranging from former CEOs and senior advisors to our own managing partner, all the way down to office managers and a selection of people that were really passionate in between. And we started meeting on a weekly basis um, first, understanding where we're coming from and our goals and how our background sort of informed our goals for what we wanted to Fraser accomplish. And then a specific set of initiatives, which led to 10 specific initiatives that we sort of kicked off, you know, last year. Great. Well, a lot of work quickly, though. So, Tanya, they, they hire you, you come on uh, and you get on board. And I know you're looking both, again, at the Fraser level, also the portfolio level. And so when you got in, uh, involved here and engaged, how did you accelerate the pace of change? You know, what was important to you in kind of honing your definition of diversity and how it could be pulled through and be relevant for each of your organizations? 
Yeah, no, it's great, great questions. Um, so I joined Fraser just over a year ago, and you know there had been some work you know done to date as as Andy chatted about, and you know I had an opportunity to help you know Andy roll that heavy boulder you know up the hill that he you know had been um, pushing himself and with some help of others. So I just you know got next to him and we started pushing it together, and I think that the Fraser team saw that. We were making DEIA a personal priority of ours. And so it was so much easier, I think, for us to recruit this team. And, you know, we already had a lot of excitement in the organization to help us accelerate it. And, you know, as Andy said, having the backing of our founder, um, Alan Frazier, and then one of our managing partners, you know, Nader Naini, um, they've been huge supporters of this and, and real sponsors of the work. And beyond that, um, they're, they're really more than sponsors. You know, they're actively involved um, because they're leading initiatives on their own. And, you know, I think that is what makes it, um, you know, such an exciting and um, passionate um, initiative um, for Frazier. And I think that's what's helped um, create some excitement and, um, you know, energy within our port coast too. So kind of role modeling it for them that yes, Fraser is doing it as we look and it sounds like there's appetite for it in the portfolio companies, but Fraser also is kind of modeling it at the, at the home base, if you will. And has that uh, been meaningful yeah. to portfolio companies? Yes, absolutely. And you know, anytime you think about um, trying to get some traction and energy behind an initiative and um, you know, having people around you to get advice, um, it's so important that Fraser role model that first, um, because we can share with our portfolio companies some of our obstacles that we had to overcome, you know, learnings along the way. And because we're, you know, further on our journey, um, we have a little bit more bandwidth to help them, um, for many of them, um, being at the start of their DEI journey as well. And I know in talking to you both, it's been incredibly impressive that you've taken a very data-based perspective to this. Um, I think that's been interesting. And, you know, a lot of people are pulling apart data. You've, you've really amassed really a lot of interesting data, um, both at the portfolio level and then, you know, kind of at the aggregate level. And similarly, you know, we always think of the, you know, the sponsors as asking for information from the portfolio companies. You kind of flip this, you know, flip it on its head. And you've taken a lot of the burden of a lot of the analytics off of it, a lot of framing up off of, off of their plates, and you really position yourselves as enablers, that everybody has the same goal to improve on these metrics and, you know, DEI and A, but um, how do you do that and what do you give them to do that to enable versus burden them? Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think it, I think you put it right. We, what we wanted to, to do for them is say, hey, we're going to give you information that we know you want, and we'll pick up a shovel here and do some of the, some of the heavy lifting for you. And so we made the, the data request pretty simple. We, first, we asked them, we had a call with all the HR leaders. We said, here's what we're trying to accomplish. These were the, the asks. Are these asks excessively burdensome? And the response was, no, I think we could do that. And then... Um, we took it upon ourselves to take the first run of like aggregating the data. And the promise was we were going to play it back to them. So there was the give back of which they knew they sort of should have had, should have this information already. And then we, I think we were thoughtful about how we thought about um, collecting the data or how we played back the data where we just didn't say uh, we want to look at um, percentage of demographics, whole population. You know, we wanted to look at percentage of demographics, whole population, and people making over 100, you know, K, which is basically your directors above. And if we only looked at people making at over 200 K and percentage of people that got promoted by various demographics, and those sorts of things, right? So we looked at across the D and, um, you know, alignment of hourly pay by demographics. So we looked at the DEIA and made sure we were collecting data against each one of those in a way that could help our companies benchmark against each other and give us a baseline from which to work from. So Tanya, how do you keep that going? You know, you you, you did the, the, picked up the shovel, you did the heavy lifting in the beginning, but now it needs to be not burdensome, but something that becomes part of kind of the operating process. So where are you and your companies in terms of your, you know, your metrics and how close are you to seeing movement on, against your goals? Sure. Um, so building off of, of where Andy left off, um, you know, after we had a chance to look at that, 
the data from the portfolio companies, um, we shared that back with them and asked our heads of HR and CEOs to reflect on it and to think about their own commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, and advancement um, as they looked at that data and asked themselves, you know, where do we have gaps in each of those areas? And based on those gaps, how um, do we want to try to fill them so that we're, we're living our commitment to uh, DEIA as well as living our commitment to our, our team's values? And um, from that uh, exercise, they came back to their Fraser boards in December of 2020, shared their data, shared their commitment, uh, talked about their 2021 initiatives, and where they need uh, support, um, not just from you know, their internal uh, teams and leaders, but also from Frazier. And so Andy and myself and our co colleague Devin O'Connor and even our DEIA group um, have become resources to our portfolio companies to help them accelerate those initiatives. Um, from there, um, Andy and I have regular uh, touch points with our CHROs. Um, we will have quarter, uh, quarterly um, kind of more formal touch bases on the DEIA initiatives and progress. And then two times a year, um, the CHROs and CEOs will report to their boards um, how they're progressing against their, um, their initiatives. And then we'll also look at that census data again um, to see from a data perspective um, how they're moving the needle. Wow, so a lot of interconnectivity. Um, so I think that, you know, we've said kind of picking up the shovel for them. We talked about enabling versus burdening as being, you know, kind of a, a different way of approaching it for a sponsor. Are there any other things that you think Fraser has done very, that's very unique in approaching DEIA? Um, as I think everybody has this intention that it needs to play a role somewhere in their business, but you've actually made it very intentional and taken on a lot of work and you know, burden around it. What have you done also that you think is, is unique and puts you ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick that off. So as I think about, you know, the initiatives, my guess is most firms could look at the work we've done around um, pulse surveys or putting together scorecards, um, you know, doing unconscious bias training. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think a lot of firms would say, yeah, you know, we've done that too. And I think what's been so unique about our approach is starting with our values and taking a really hard look at who we are, you know, what's made us successful to date, and what is it that we need to do in order to be, you know, an even stronger firm uh, for our associates today, our companies, and then really the whole ecosystem. And so by starting there with a cross-functional team um, within our firm from, you know, uh, managing partner all the way through, you know, our operations team and having those tough conversations from the beginning um, while we were making, you know, um, headway on our initiatives, I think it was the overall approach that makes us unique. And it gained so much momentum because we were showing progress and because we were approaching it both from, you know, the head with, you know, metrics and clear goals and the heart around culture um, is really what's going to be, I think, part of our like special sauce and what makes this um, living and breathing um, in it, initiative and even just part of our DNA. I shouldn't even call it an initiative. It's not that. It's just how we work today um, that I think is what makes it um, so special uh, to Fraser. And I, I honestly think our portfolio companies have seen that and they've heard it from our team and, and they are trying to replicate um, something similar within their organizations. And this is Phil. So I, you know, I gotta, there's two things here. And the first one, I really have to give Tanya credit because so my mentality is like, there's a job to do. Let's, you know, project manage, you know, the heck out of it. Let's set initiatives, let's set goals, let's execute. And Tanya, especially with the working group is like, let's start a place of understanding where people are coming from and how that's shaping what they want to accomplish and what are they going to be passionate about working with. And so we had a session where it was nothing about talking about each one of us, our background, you know, and how that influenced, you know, what we've done or what we haven't done around DEIA and our goals around that. And it was sort of very personal, you know, and so there were, there were, there were some tears or, you know, and that sort of thing. And I think some firms would say, that's too soft, what is going to come of that? But actually that set the, the framework, <laughs> excuse me, for people to work together to actually do that. 
do that the you know, work and really to do it in a way that was genuine and put real effort behind it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think is the courage of our leaders, our general partners to say, we're not gonna hide from what we know we're not gonna like. So we talked to a lot of our firms at the um, private equity, there's a private equity human capital round table where like there's 60 of our peers. And I've got to say that like 80, 90% say, we don't want to collect the data because we're scared of what we're going to find out. And then if we know about it, then we got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And our partners have taken the opposite approach is like, we've got to find out what the data says and what's happening so that we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I really appreciate um, the courage that they had you know, and then the courage to play that back to our LPs and our other stakeholders and say, we're good in these areas, these other areas, we're frankly a little disappointed, but we're going to be working hard at this and, you know, give us some time to, you know, to get better. But even that courage, I think you have to have that courage. So it's vulnerability, it's vulnerability as a firm and it's vulnerability as an individual is like the first step towards making progress. Well, it's interesting you also talk about mission, Tanya, and you talked about heart, Andy. And it's one of the things we heard as we've been in the market and talking to investors and talking to CEOs around this topic. And I think uniquely to healthcare, they say, that's what we're in. We're in a business where we are providing for everybody, no matter what your situation, we are providing you some kind of access to, to care. And so if there's not one sector that it's most meaningful to, it has to be the sector um, because it touches everybody. And so our, our, our clients at the end of the day, our customers at the end of the day, our patients, our members look incredibly diverse across this country and they are everybody. So I think this particular connection here into the sector, so. So Andy, you, you started with, you know, kind of the heart and the courage and the vulnerability is kind of one of the pieces of advice you'd start with. Tanya, do you have, or, or Andy, do you have any other piece of advice for any other leaders who want to, you know, really step change their performance around DEIA? Yeah, you know, what I think I would say here, and it's, it's something I had to do myself is, you know, when I, you know, embarked on this work with Andy, um, this is something I've done many times in the course of my career. And I asked myself, like, how is it going to be different this time? Because I want to make sure our firm is aggressive and there's passion and we make a difference. And I haven't, you know, unfortunately in my career made as much progress in the space as I would have liked to. So I said, well, how's it going to be different, you know, at Frazier? And what I said is, for me, I have to understand the why. Like, why am I doing this? I have to make it personal. And I think as Andy, you know, shared when we had, you know, the first uh, working session and, and got a little bit vulnerable as a group as to why are we doing this? I think everyone was able to take away from that discussion, like, this is what it means to me. And this is the impact that I want to make on others. And, and I think for some of us, we even started thinking about our legacy as leaders. I know Ellen Frazier has, I know Nader has, and I know many others. And so my advice to leaders would, would be, um, know why you're doing this personally as a leader and you know what is the legacy that you want to leave behind at the company that you lead um, doing this because it's the right thing probably isn't enough anymore um, we've got to make it personal and I think that is the only way to really make some step change um, as it relates to DEIA today yeah and I think I'd add like you just have to challenge assumptions Challenge assumptions around qualifications for a candidate. Mm -hmm. Challenge assumptions around the timing in which you need to fill a role. I mean, things we've explored to try to get diverse candidates are, do they really have to have investment banking experience and why? Mm -hmm. Does someone really have to live in Seattle to be a member of the investment professional team? You know, if so, why, right? Because the larger the aperture that you're willing to consider, the more potential opportunities that you can um, uh, consider in order to, you know, move the ball forward. And that's been, and thankfully we've had a group that's been open. That doesn't mean that every time they've said, you're right, we don't need those things or those sorts of things, but they've been really good conversations. And we're on the doorstep of, I think, doing some really impressive things where we'll look different as a firm, you know, a year from now um, than we do today. Well, I have a thought off of what you just said, Andy. I think that, you know, that's music to our ears as we're trying to wi always widen the pool uh, and especially in this, you know, very, very tight talent pool that's out there. And I think that when you do that, a couple of questions arise, which is, you know, 
where we're working with clients who are often risk averse. You know, we go in with a thesis and a timeline and we wanna make sure we hit those milestones in, in as accelerated timeframe as possible. So introducing risk is always, you know, uncomfortable. So if you open the aperture, if you take a bet on somebody who hasn't demonstrated X, Y, or Z, um, it introduces risk and, and that's a, often a hard conversation. And then my follow-up question also is, if you do open it up to people who may be a little, you know, outside of the, the sweet spot, what do you need to do as part of the process to bring them through and give them a fair shot versus check the box? Yes, we interviewed diverse candidates. They don't fit X, Y, and Z. And how do you train or not train, retrain, I guess, the team to approach potentially interviewing candidates like that or thinking about them differently? Yeah, it starts with a really good scorecard. And people talk about scorecard as job spec, whatever, but we do it differently in that we don't talk, most people start with experience, right? I imagine you have it, Phyllis. People get on the call and you sort of like, what do you need? Well, it needs to be five years of this and it needs to be 10 years of that. They need to have hit this metric. We don't do that. We start with like, what's the outcomes of success for this role? And then once you've defined that, you uh, the second page is what are the capabilities someone would need in order to achieve those outcomes. And then the third part of that is what's the minimum bar of experience someone would have to have a fighting chance of success. So what it changes, is it changes from the check the box on the experience base, you know, to the what, how, what are the different ways someone should sh could show the competencies mm -hmm. necessary to achieve these outcomes. And what I keep telling the partners is that if someone's done exactly the same role before, and now they're eligible to do that here. You got to ask, are they the best people available? Because normally that person's probably a second rate individual because otherwise, why would they make that move from here to us if they've already have all this core skills and those sorts of things? So we're trying to get people that where their trajectory is, is um, you know, exponential in terms of their career potential. And so we talk about capabilities and all the different ways someone could have demonstrated that capabilities adjacent to the actual you know, role that they've, that they would be doing here. I would imagine also then when you're debriefing as a group, you need to also be honest and vulnerable and open to be able to really say where somebody you might not measure up, but you see potential based on, you know, whatever we've been able to glean and getting to know them. Yeah. And if you look at it, just an investment professional is a good example. You say they have to have good modeling skills. Right, they have to have good business development skills. They have to be able to learn the sell, you know, the buy side process. Right, just because someone's a banker doesn't mean they have those things. Right, and so you'd say, well, if they came from a consulting firm, they, you know, and one business, and they probably have good business development skills. And if they, you know, there's many different ways to get good modeling skills or do a a, a test, right, sort of a case study test. And so it's just a different way to approach it than. Um, have they done this? Have they done that? Have they done the other thing before? So one last question, when you think about bringing them in then, and you're going to potentially open up a little bit of risk or they're a non-traditional candidate or somebody really kind of outside the sweet spot, you know, whether it's on the inclusion or advancement side, how do you ensure that they're set up for success once you bring them in? I'll take that one. Um, so you know, one thing I'll just add to the scorecard that's new for us this year in a, from a dimension standpoint, and then I'll, I'll um, answer your question, is we're also including a section on our values and what are moments of truth one might face in their role and, you know, what would success look like? And so that, you know, will be incorporated into our assessment process as well, you know, to really look at that individual in a very well-rounded way. Um, you know, Andy, myself, um, our colleague, Devin, we're all certified executive coaches. And, you know, as we think about uh, development of existing talent, some of the things that we're doing for um, team members that I think we could um, translate into onboarding as well is um, all females in our firm have a coach um, and or a mentor, um, and especially those who've been recently promoted uh, with clear, you know, coaching objectives a regular cadence of coaching, you know, the 360 feedback, uh, touch bases, you know, with their, uh, their manager. And then, you know, one of the things that we're looking at as a firm right now is what can we do more formally from a developmental standpoint, as it relates to maybe some of those gaps one might have, you know, when they come through the door, and it could be leadership related, 
Um, so first time, you know, supervisor could be technical related, uh, but we recognize Phyllis that we have a responsibility uh, when we bring people through that door that it's not just all right, you know, they've um, been given an offer and they go through a standard onboarding, but you know, what type of mentoring is it that they need? Um, when will they do their first 360? What kind of uh, sponsorship, you know, will they need when they're looking at deals, et cetera? Um, so we're already starting to think a little bigger about that. Terrific, terrific. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Tanya. This has been tremendously helpful. Um, much appreciated for kind of opening the kimono and sharing a little bit about what Fraser has been doing, you know, in their very, you know, dedicated and, and deliberate attempt at uh, making this part of your core values. So thank you so much for the time with us. And we really appreciate you sharing your stories. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Thanks for your leadership.